Before you're too comfortable, would you take your copy of the Bible and let's stand, if we're able, in honor and reverence of the teaching of Scripture. We say this every Sunday. I ask you to say it with me now. Open my eyes that I might receive wonderful words from your law. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Today, God willing, is the fifth and final message in our series of sermons called The Power of Forgiveness. I invite you now to turn to the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, where today's text is Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. I want to talk to you today on this subject. Forgiven people are forgiving people. People who have been forgiven are the people that God is calling to extend forgiveness to others. I've been thinking about my granddad a whole lot this past week. He passed away last Memorial Day weekend at age 89. Had he lived to this past week, he would have reached his 90th birthday. I was his oldest grandson. He was not a pastor, to say the least. He was a proud United States Marine and a small business owner and a farmer his whole life, literally born on a farm, (laughs) died on a farm. One thing I'm certain I got from him is my love of golf. Though he grew up in poverty as a sharecropper's son, when he joined the Marine Corps, someone introduced him to golf, and he became really, really good as an amateur golfer for the United States Marines. My dad's never played golf, doesn't care to. But because I saw my grandfather playing, I became interested. I remember being a little boy in Jenkinsburg, Georgia, when I would stay with them on spring break or in the summer. He'd go out in one corner of his pasture with a whole bag of balls and With whatever club he wanted, he would just hit them any direction he wanted across the pasture. I remember standing there watching him. He'd say, watch this one, son. It's going to go from left to right. It's called a fade. (laughs) Watch this one, son. It's going to go right to left. It's called a draw. (laughs) You want to hit one? Yeah, Paul, Paul. And I remember I would get up there with his clubs and, oh, not even close. Not even close to as good as his. I can feel it in this moment. He would come and stand behind me. I remember his unshaven chin on the top of my head. He put his big old strong farming arms around me. And this is what he'd say. Relax. Let my arms do the work. Relax, Jeremy, relax. Feel this motion. Let my arms do the work. Forgiveness can be so hard, can it not? In some sense, outside of Christ, forgiveness is impossible. Today, we need to feel the loving arms of Jesus. Let his hands do the work. Let his arms around us do through us what we cannot do in our own strength. Hear this 
inspiring or troubling story, depending on how you view it. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Wow. Then he said this. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded him that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me, I'll pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion. He released him. He forgave him the loan. That servant, though, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a 100 denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay me what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. But he was not willing. Instead, he threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed. They went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. Hear these words. So also, my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from his heart. Oh God, in these moments of Bible teaching, as soberly as I can and as reverently as I can, I bow before you and beg that in this moment and online, you would speak your words. May the Spirit of God do the work in our hearts that all of us, including me, so desperately need. We are nothing without you. We acknowledge forgiveness is wonderful to receive, but sometimes we struggle to give it but we want to learn to give it in honor of Christ and through the power of his name. So may Jesus convict and transform and heal and do in these few moments we have together only what he can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we walk through the text, let me make three introductory statements. This is true for all of us. You and I are sinners, and we cannot save ourselves. Romans 3.10 says, none of us are righteous outside of Christ." Romans 3.23 says, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. None of us can save himself or herself by good works. If you're ever asked, 
Why Christianity? Unashamedly and graciously say this. Because Christianity is the only religion in the world that is the story of God reaching for the people instead of the people reaching for God. All the other world religions are man's attempt to get to God, but Christianity is the story of Jesus coming to us. Number two, no matter who you are or what you've done, you can be forgiven of your sins, you can be saved, you can be kept forever. We got some bad sins in this room. I got some bad sins right here. No need to compare the deeds of our sins. None of our sins are a match for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Anybody here as clumsy as me and as awkward as me? I'm 42 years old and I still can't eat without spilling it all over myself. I don't know if it's because I'm jittery or if I'm in a hurry or I like it so much, I eat it so fast. I was born eating fast. I'm just telling you, I spill it all over myself. And Carrie doesn't even flinch anymore. Ketchup, coffee, barbecue sauce, whatever it is. Right when it hits me, she just handed to me, handed to me. I don't know what she does, but she somehow takes it and hand it to Jesus. He'll make it new. But the third thing is where we're all going to need God's special help. If you've been forgiven, if you've been born again, if you're a Christian, you must forgive everyone else in your life. If you've been forgiven, you must forgive. This is much easier to say than it is to do. Peter knew this. Credit Peter. He's eager to be right with Jesus. When you read about Peter in the Gospels, he wants to be close to Jesus. He was a big, bold personality. And he knew that Traditional rabbis taught, if you've been offended, forgive them three times, but past the third, you're under no obligation to forgive. Peter's doing some math in his mind. Jesus is the superior rabbi. Maybe he'll go to seven, the number of perfection. Jesus, if my brother or my sister hurts me seven times, seven times, shall I forgive them up to seven So personal in the language too. My brother or my sister can mean family, proximity, close friend. Sometimes the people that are the closest to us are the hardest to forgive because the wound is so deep. Jesus says this, It's not about math, Peter. (laughs) 70 times seven. Some have said, was he saying 77? Is he saying 490? I promise you, Jesus' point wasn't that we carry around little pocket folders and, oh, forgiveness, I'm tallying them up. No, 1 Corinthians 13, five says, love doesn't keep a record of wrongdoing. Jesus' point is that if you are mine, If you are following me, if you are like me, you will forgive fully and completely. And then he tells a remarkable story. This is not one of those stories where when we tell it, we go, ooh, yeah, I love it. Sweet, happy ending. It literally ends like this. You don't forgive? 
You're going to be judged and separated from God for all eternity, and you're going to be tortured. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I mean, can you just hear Jesus saying this? There ain't no soft way to put this. Forgiven people must forgive people or God will judge them. That is the big idea of the story. If you want to be like Christ, he'll forgive you. But like him, we must forgive others or he will judge us. And notice how the parable ends. There's a direct connection between the genuineness of our salvation and the authenticity of our forgiveness. He doesn't say, forgive them with your mouth. You're forget. He says, from the heart. Oh. It means fully and completely from the inside as much as I can in my human ability as unto the Lord, I want to treat you like Jesus treats me. Matthew 6, 12. In the middle of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, pray like this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's actually in the language, the picture of a wheel. How many times should I forgive somebody? Many times as Jesus has forgiven me. Lest you think that's too strong, he finishes the prayer, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, and he says this. If you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Matthew 6, Matthew 18, there's this connection in the language between, I want to follow you, Jesus. Do you? Then adopt grace by my standards and not the world's standards. There's so much that we could say about this, but how about just a few things? The point of the parable is that we'll be more forgiving, not less. Unforgiveness leads to torture. Forgiveness leads to healing. What a shame that the man who was forgiven in our day and time, millions, he was forgiven millions, and his servant owed him a hundred, but he said, absolutely not. You pay me. I'm going to punish you. What? And the owner, the king says, this is injustice. You must be tortured. Jesus literally uses the language of comparison to say, this is our future. This is our future. If we live with unforgiveness in our heart. Remember I shared with you last week the John Hopkins medical study that said there's all kind of medical and physical benefits to forgiveness. They didn't even quote the Bible in the study, but less headaches, lower blood pressure, better hypertension, less ulcers, sleep better. Oh! these things that science science is saying if you walk around bitter it'll kill you may God help us forgive <laughs> number two nobody can offend me to the extent that my sins offended God yet he forgives well, you don't know what they've done to me. Do you know what you did to Jesus? Well, you, you can't imagine how much. I know it hurts, but so did the cross. Do your kids like to play Monopoly? Sometimes it's good to turn off the TV, say no electronics, and just old-fashioned Monopoly. And it trips me out when my children with that fake Monopoly money, I mean just... <laughs> And who, what you got, what you got. And I'm getting your property, and I stole that property. And, I, and it's so funny with money that's not real in a house I'm paying for. And them children playing games like they're going to take my house. <laughs> you just don't know how bad. Mm. 
money that ain't yours, in a world that ain't yours. Do, do you think you can tell God how this is supposed to go? You know, when it's me, I say, I, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. I hope for mercy. But when it's you, justice, we need justice. You ever notice that? When it's me, nobody's perfect. That is the understatement of the universe. Ain't nobody at the church perfect. Oh, not only that, they're all, you know. <laughs> how much? How much did it offend God? Well, look what he paid for it. I, I, I don't even know how much my sin violated the holy conscience of God but I know he poured out the best of heaven to deal with it. I can't fathom giving up one of my children because you spat in somebody's face, but God did it for all of us. Number three, even if they never apologize, we still forgive. I know, I, I wish this one wasn't in here. Well, the second they show some humility, I'll apologize. But yet Jesus' dying words, literally his last uttered words for the human race to his father in heaven in Luke 23, 34, when he died on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. No one apologized to Jesus. <laughs> he was fully committed to forgiving them. Number four, the the wicked servant, notice, there's no mention of his behavior bothering him. It was his fellow servants that said, hey, hey, injustice over here. I mean, this wicked servant who'd been forgiven of millions, who's putting a guy in jail that owed him 100, he doesn't even realize the severity of what he's done. It's his fellow servants that pointed out, listen to this, sometimes we're blind to our own sin we can't even see it because we're in it, but others around us see it, which is precisely why God's given us the body of Christ and accountability and tells us in Proverbs to have a teachable spirit and not to be stiff-necked and proud and act like we know stuff. It's the reason none of us have eyes in the back of our head. If someone comes to you with a humble Christ-like spirit and they call you on something, don't be proud, be humble. And after you're humble, be grateful because the kisses of a fr the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of the enemy. He didn't even know, but his friends knew it. You ever see people that have hurt, but they kill, they're, they're riding around, still rolling over people. Yeah. God, help them see the light. Help me see the light. Last, the king in this parable, he can do anything. He's the king. He is Lord over all. All decisions he makes for others are right and righteous. I love how he gives grace. <laughs> when you can't pay, he says, that's okay. Your bill's forgiven. Nobody here could afford to pay. <laughs> forgiven. Grace. That's our king. And compassion, when we beg for mercy, I love this, oh, king, I can't pay, I, I can't do it, please have mercy. I love this, he's moved with compassion. When we beg with repentance, in sorrow and in tears, his heart's moved with compassion. But when we are proud, stiff, self-righteous, his heart gets angry. The same God that's able to offer justice to your offender is the one who can bring healing to you. I was thinking about this recently. I was visiting a friend in the hospital and I had to cut through the emergency room. And there was, I mean, God, 
bless emergency room personnel. You don't ever know what's coming through the door. Same staff dealing with all of it. And in the room down from us were some deputies guarding a guy that had been involved in an altercation and he needed some treatment. But when he got his treatment, you know where they were taking him back. Same staff dealing with all of it. I'm not qualified to deal with all of it. Jesus is. You know how much they hurt me? You know what they did to me? And I've heard stories of drunk driving and death and abuse and abandonment. And they are real. God's big enough to deal with it. You come humbly to the king and totally trust your future to him. That's the only way forward. I wrote this in my notes, and I'm just going to share it with you as we close. Hurt is real. Our pain may never fully heal. Our pain may never fully heal in this life. We can't defend injustice. We'll never defend hatred. We'll never defend or justify sinful actions. In fact, when someone in our family is hurting, we weep with them. We care. We grieve the losses in the body of Christ. But the only way to be free and the only way to be happy and the only way to be healthy is by looking forward to Jesus, not back at the offense. This morning, as we wrap up this series, here's what we can look forward to Jesus, the king that gets it right, or back on the offense and stay mad and bitter. But we can't do both. The only place my heart makes sense, the only place my hurt makes sense, the only place my life begins to heal, the only place I'm totally winning, even if the world thinks I'm losing, is when I'm following Jesus. Following Jesus. We're gonna sing this song in just a minute. This, I mean, I've been playing it on my Spotify. Hold on, hold it, don't, don't make, not too loud yet, not too loud, Dr. Cliff. Dr. Cliff, keep it low for me. I still got one word to say, thank you. He's Dr. Cliff. I'm do- we work all week to just make this moment as smooth like that right there, you know, we're smooth. Here's how it goes. I give my life to follow Jesus Captive to Christ, I know true freedom. I count it all joy to take up my cross. I'll follow. This is so beautiful. What a joy it is to follow Jesus. What a gift to bear his name. What an honor to choose surrender. Make him my everything. So this morning, while Dr. Cliff and April lead us, I really feel there's two groups of people that should consider coming to the altar, and I'm gonna pray over us. That's it, I'm gonna pray over us. I've been on both sides of what I'm about to share. I'm gonna pray for God's healing grace. I think people should come this morning and just be right here at the altar. If you know you need to forgive, you know you should forgive, and you wanna forgive, you're just not sure if you can yet. It hurts bad. It's real, and you want to do it right. But I'm telling you, you're so mad, you're so wounded. Sometimes you can't even tell the difference between anger and grief. It hurts so bad. If if that You want to forgive, but you're just not sure you got the strength yet. Let me pray for you. Or you, you would forgive, but there's a lack of closure that you long for. Maybe the person died. Maybe the person's done something to you and moved on, but you hadn't been able to move on. And you need a miraculous touch that only God can give. Maybe it was something that it'll never come back on this earth like it once was. God can give me a touch that sustains me. Whoever needs to respond, I'm gonna pray. And the second Cliff and April start singing. You worship with them, and if you need to come, I'm gonna lead a prayer at the altar. Hey, you need to make a decision for Jesus, join the church. We got our altar team close by. 
God, may we say yes to you, whatever it is. Speak, Jesus, as only you can. Move in our hearts in Christ's name.